morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm really pleased to be here this morning. And uh, we're going to be talking today about the future of live events. Um, just a tiny bit of housekeeping. You may notice that you're mute, or please do mute yourselves so we don't have any sound interruption. And secondly, there's a little box for asking questions as we go. So if any, any questions pop up, please type them in, and we'll try and get to those at the end. So I'd like to welcome our panellists today. And uh, I'd firstly like to start with Marcus. He's an award-winning lighting designer, has his own practice. Welcome, Marcus. And I'd like to move over. We have two Pauls with us today. We have Paul Shoesmith, who's with us, who's uh, from Enigma Lighting. And they also uh, distribute and manufacture lights. Morning. Paul is uh, Paul James who um, is from Dark. He's the managing director there, looking after the Dark show, the Dark magazine, Art magazine, um, and everything with the word Arc in it, light related. Morning. And Hi. lastly, and not least, we have Eve with us, who's a marketeer for the lighting industry. And I would say, happy birthday to Parrot PR and Marketing <laughs> Day. <Three years. laughs> Thank you, Emma. <laughs> So to kick off, um, I'm going to go back to Marcus, who I believe started this whole conversation with a quote on LinkedIn, which was then answered by, or uh, related to, by Paul Shoesmith. Over to you, Marcus. So yeah, we were um, talking and I posted on LinkedIn and Paul posted on LinkedIn, Paul Shoesmith, and we were discussing how do events work in lighting now that we can't see uh, products live a lot of the time there aren't the shows to go to uh, light and build was cancelled so we can't go over there and see all the new products what happens how do you find out about new products how do you discover what you're going to use in projects how do manufacturers get out there and um, show innovative technology to potential clients and find new clients and i think it's a fascinating area and i, I really it's interesting because I don't know how it's going to function in the future, but um, yeah, that was it. And then Paul chimes in uh, discussing from a manufacturer's point of view. Yeah. Um, so obviously light and build is, is uh, a, the, the biggest lighting show you can go to. And, and it was almost getting to a point where it was at saturation point in terms of being able to go to that show and, and, see everything in in the, the few days that it's on so perhaps it was coming to a good time where it needed to be rethought about how you see these new products there's also the the carbon element so the the environmental impact of going to these shows the cost of doing it so it was a, a bigger picture as to how we move forward with 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 events and witnessing and seeing lit products because that's the hardest thing over the last four months is how do people like Marcus see a product lit and be able to specify it without seeing it in the flesh? So yeah, that was the, that was the sort of crux of it from the start. Moving on from there to Paul James, how have you had to adapt um, the way you are trying to relate to people with the events that you're putting on that have now had to turn virtual? Yeah, well, obviously we we had to cancel Dark Room uh, and sort of the Dark Room Live element of that, which was the conference. We've we've quite easily been able to turn that into a virtual event, Dark Room Live Stream. So that's going to be you know taking place at the same time that it would have done, September the sixteenth to the eighteenth. And actually, in a funny kind of way, the conference element of it, it it's allowed us to be much bigger. You know, we've, we've got speakers from all over the world. Uh, we're just about to go live with registration. So, I mean, we, we, were, all, we were fortunate in that our events have all, always been hybrid events. So we've always had a venue, but then we've always streamed it anyway. So both for the Dark Awards and for Dark Room, you know, that's what we've done. So we were in a position to do that, but we just had to think a lot more about the virtual element for the, the, the exhibition side. So we've ended up using a, like a networking platform. So rather than just have Zoom or a, a webinar, anyone who registers for Darkroom live stream will, actually, will be able to network with each other and with, with fellow attendees, 
and with sponsors and set up one-to-one -one video meetings within the platform whilst the event is going on. So it's actually, for the dark room element, it's worked out pretty well. We're not for one minute saying that virtual events will replace live events because it, you know, it's never going to be the same. And Marcus's point about you know, needing to see products you know, in action. But I think it'll certainly be interesting for us to do dark room live stream in September just to see the, the reaction. But, you know, certainly from a conference point of view, I think it'll work really well. And then the exhibitors are there to to engage with the attendees. And one, one really good thing about the virtual element is the exhibitors can see every single attendee and approach them to have meetings. Whereas obviously if you're in a, a venue, you're reliant on those attendees to come to your stand or for, for you to bump into them almost. This way, the, you know, the, the return of investment is, you know, it is really good if you can see all the attendees and you know, approach them for meetings. So, Paul, yeah. um, do you think this has led to an acceleration of the digital environment for events? I mean, I was at a show last year and they had a little bit of that element where there's an app and you're encouraged to arrange appointments before and it manages your diary. Do you think that that movement, like you were describing, into arranging meetings, having virtual meetings during that dedicated conference time, but it's all online, is where things are going to go? Certainly in the short to medium term. I mean, virtual events aren't anything new. I mean, you know, webinars have been around for, you know, a long time. But I think it was, you know, this has been born out of necessity. And I think so many people now, are, you know, have used zoom or you know other uh, virtual platforms that, that you know that they're actually seeing the benefits of it you know and certainly when it comes to do i need to fly halfway around the world to have a meeting when i can just do it by video conference you know that that's the interesting part and i've had you know conversations with with designers who you know who will definitely change the way they work in terms of site meetings you know sure you would you know you will have to go in the future but not as much you know that there, there is no need to to fly to a lot of places for so many times the the event side of thing is a different kettle of fish i think i still think the virtual event is a temporary fix but i can certainly see the future being more hybrid where you have you do have a real event in a venue but then there are options for people not to attend the event but still to participate yeah i think what it does actually paul is it, it acts as a bit of a springboard for people because very often uh, you can go to an exhibition and uh, you can spend a lot of time there two days out of your diary perhaps and i sit sit on both sides of the fence because i represent manufacturers and designers and manufacturers want to shift product and designers want to specify it so if they can have initial virtual meetings and see whether that gives them a flavor perhaps um, and scope for further conversation i think what it does is, is cut out a lot of time uh, and minimizes perhaps the face-to-face my meetings to ones that are going to add perhaps more value um, and and what the designers are actually looking for so it saves time uh, both sides of the, of the table i think yeah and I, I do think though that you know big events mean big problems certainly in the you know in the medium term because people you know it, even when we begin to get back to normal people are still going to be nervous about you know flying halfway around the world or you know meeting loads of people and I, I think you know there, there's a lot of issues there for these really big events you know big conferences big big exhibitions and that this is where maybe the smaller events where it's you know more local or certainly national regional will you know will come into its own you know i, I think it will, it will eventually obviously all go back to normal we, we hope but you know it's how long will that take i think is the you know the big question yeah i think it might be too yeah. late by then though do you think the the change of environment and having it more localized like you say nationally or even across cities 
and for a sustained period of time would get change people's mindsets that you know do i need to then have to go to frankfurt you know people across the world and it more you know it would it would change people's mindset to it do you think I, well it's definitely that's got that's got to be part of the argument but you know and people are thinking more about climate change as well so you know it, if it does mean you're getting on a plane less and you know and you you don't want to go to these big events then you know that that could be a big player in the future but will it be driven by manufacturers who still want to have a huge you know event every two years for everyone to congregate at you know because that is you know is that what they want in the mm. future um, you know, it'll be, it will be definitely it'll be very interesting to see what happens. And I think from an economical perspective, it, it will have an effect as well, because currently the, the events industry, and this, this stats uh, just a few months uh, old, uh, contributes to 32.6 billion to the UK each year. And in terms of driving international visits, uh, to the UK, it's a quarter of the 38 million visitors that actually come to the UK come to go to an in-person event. So it's going to have this overarching effect as well as the specifics we're talking about to perhaps the economy and those side of things. So looking at it from a flip side. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's obviously it's huge for the economy and, you know, and it, it is, you know, let's be honest, it's a much better experience for the yeah. ND, you know, with like I say, you know, I don't think virtual events are going to take over live events at all. It's just how long will it take and in what, in what form will it be when, when we do get some kind of normal, I think is interesting. Well, we're, think, we're a relationships industry, aren't we? That's, that's the reality. And uh, people like to meet people and a lot of business is done at stand parties or in the bar I don't think we can we can deny that it's it's very much relationships based and and that's a little bit more difficult to to kind of replicate virtually I think so yeah well, I think we've also got lighting I mean it's, it's light you have to see it you have to see it in person I mean I've been to Frankfurt a few times and uh, other shows and you go there a lot of the time I'm going there partly it's for connections to meet people I don't get to see often, but also it's to go there and see the light. I need to be there physically seeing the properties of the products that I'm gonna specify. And there are certain manufacturers who often, when you see it online, you see pictures of the fittings, you just think, well, that's a fitting. But then when you see the light, you see the quality, you see the build, live in person you just suddenly realize how fantastic it is and how it's worth putting in projects and you might not have done that if you'd just seen it virtually but i think it's it's interesting we talk about the impact on the environment of traveling everyone going over to frankfurt if we see smaller events is it though a case that people are going to have to tour around lots of smaller regional events to be able to get an overarching knowledge of the industry? Because there's a certain, there's a lot of manufacturers that get pulled in. And if you're just running a small event, there's only going to be a few. Is it a case that we're going to see more events targeted on niches or specific types of products? So we're going to see things like this is a street lighting exhibition this is a public realm lighting exhibition this is a retail lighting exhibition and it narrows down much more into specific areas and sectors yeah i agree with that i think um if you can pick and choose based around the particular style or, or, or area that you work in when you're specifying whether you're um, you know an fm or an interior designer or an exterior lighting designer you can then pick and choose the events you go to is more specialist so that that makes perfect sense to me for sure yeah there's definitely something in that i mean what what, what we did with dark room was we just shrunk everything so everyone has just got a, a small space that they had to think about you know to to light that space and to show their products so there is still potential for a small event to have 100 150 exhibitors if you wanted you know because you know the space is there 
because it, it is almost a mini um, light and build, isn't it? There, because yeah. if you consider that, you know, I don't know how many halls there are, 16, 18 halls in, in, in Frankfurt, but some of those halls only have two or three manufacturers in because their stands are so huge. So if you yeah. can, you know, make shrink it and put it all into a, a smaller space, that surely makes more sense. Definitely, definitely. Absolutely. And, and also that, that gives the, you know, the smaller companies the ability to stand up, you know, stand next to the huge companies. And, you know, if, you know, our, um, you know, we, we've always thought that, you know, that, that's the way to go with, with our event to, is to enable the small company to be next to a big company. And if, you know, if you're new to lighting, you would, you would turn up and you would treat both of them exactly the same you know and, and that fits hand in hand with shrinking everything down you know, not allowing the you know the huge manufacturers to you know to take over a complete hall for mm. example um you know and that way you can get a lot more companies involved a lot more engagement you know and, and maybe going forward people will be more comfortable with that if you know if it is you know say you know we do our event in london if it is mostly UK people go into that event, but then, you know, there's another one in another country and you know, another country, you know, not by us, but, you know, smaller events in different countries, but still lots of manufacturers engaged and lots of attendees and, you know, conference speakers. I, you know, I still think you can do that in a, a smaller scale, uh, you know, very well. Well, it's more affordable as well because you know the, like you say the cost element it, it makes such a huge difference you know we, we all know how much these events can cost not just in the stand but you know, hotels and, and uh, eating drinking all that kind of stuff so you know there's yeah. an argument just for that alone the, the cost element what, what do you think Marcus in terms of um, a, you know smaller smaller stands but more often I guess that gives you well, more ability to see more people doesn't it one of the things about the smaller stands is it gets around one of my pet peeves, which is when um, I get a manufacturer who wants to take me around their entire stand and show me products that they've had for years. And it's like, I know, I know what this is. I, you know what? I know what a piece of LED strip is. Okay. I, you don't need to show me this on the stand. I understand how it works and that you have a range of ones and maybe you have different colors as well. Um, what it does is it enforces people to choose and curate a really nice uh, exhibition stand, which is new products. And that's what people want to see. They don't want to waste their time uh, with um, seeing the stuff they saw five years ago. And I, I, I love it. I love that, that it, it forces them to really think about what they're going to exhibit and where they're focusing their marketing. So I, I'm quite interested in that. Eve, I'd be interested to hear, because you do marketing uh, for manufacturers, how are they approaching it now? Because where, do they, where are they going to put their money? How are they going to get their new products out? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question, Marcus. And I think, uh, I think the obvious answer is everybody's transitioning to doing things digitally. So we're all jumping on doing product videos, um, very much looking at, uh, you know, really heightening the social media presence. So I think that's been the kind of immediate knee jerk reaction. What can we actually do in response to, to the pandemic and actually still be relatively visible in light of the fact that we can't really leave our houses or, or go too far? Now I'm seeing that manufacturers are going down the, the smaller, kind of more bespoke things. So whether it be customer entertainment, that's very, very tailored to a particular practice, for example, um, that they want to entertain and, and, and really build relationships with. Um, also, you know, the smaller showroom events, I think people are planning, you know, where people have showrooms, of course, and, and that's another conversation. Will they return in light of the fact that, that shows uh, on a larger scale may be a while off? Um, but yeah, people are looking at doing showroom events, so, you know, really smaller events and perhaps making it quite specific per practice rather than a mixed group of people just to alleviate any concerns. So um, in answer to your question, Marcus, I would say digital and social, and that's continuing very much so. And then now I find that people's marketing budgets seem to be getting bigger, which is strange uh, because they realize that they need to market and, and be out there more than ever. And they're doing that very, very tailored. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing quite specific vertical marketing and, and practice specific marketing rather than a free for all and quite generic uh, brand awareness is what I would say. 
Yeah, and that, that's something we're looking at with Dark Room Livestream as well, because if, if you have a certain level of sponsorship, every, every sponsor can be an exhibitor. So they've got their space, you know, their page and they can show product videos and product launch, you know, launch products. But then you can also book a room and you can, you can have a, a live meeting with an entire practice, like, or, you know, or a number of practices to do product demonstrations or, you know, so it's really interactive. Um, so, so that's a good part of the, the platform that we're using as well, that you can have this scenario that we're in now, but with up to 50 people if you wanted to. Um, and then with Dark Awards, we're still actually planning to go ahead as normal with Dark Awards. You know, that's due to happen in December. But obviously we have a contingency plan of, you know, we can delay it, but we can also, because of the nature of Dark Awards and, you know, the installations that we have, we could hold the Dark Awards across 10 different venues with an installation in each venue and, you know, and stream the whole thing online and have smaller amounts of attendees in each venue. So, you know, with the sponsor and the lighting design team, you know, and I think that would, you know, that goes to what you were saying, Eve, about having smaller events in showrooms. It's, it's something that we can do with a bigger event and just split it up into smaller spaces. So it's, it's safer and it actually makes it quite interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, actually, in preparation for this, I did run a LinkedIn poll just to ask people um, when they thought they would be ready for in-person events. But I did ask people to comment and, and kind of, you know, quite a few people direct messaged as well, just to give more context behind their answer. And actually, more than half of people were saying 2021 or they're undecided. But when people then um, contacted me to put more context into things, they were saying if they were smaller events, we'd be comfortable to do things the latter end of this year, but we certainly wouldn't be prepared to go to something, you know, let's say, for example, the size of light and building, um, which I guess is, is relatively obvious. So there's definitely an appetite there for smaller events. And I think people are feeling more comfortable with that idea. So it, it'll just be a slow transition. Yeah. No, I would agree with that. I mean, obviously the elephant in the room is the, you know, what's happening here in Greater Manchester, that, you know, that a lockdown is happening because I guess there's been loads and loads and loads of small events. <laughs> like people go into people's houses and ignoring the, uh, the advice and then, and then there's a spike. Um, but yes, you'd like to think that um, we'll get that sorted in the, in the months to come. Yeah, and I think if it's in a professional environment, it changed things. I think, you know, there's been quite specific advice that's been released with regards to how you can manage events uh, moving forward, you know, such as one-way systems, which actually would, would be a blessing for manufacturers, I would say, because it means the designers in, in our specific instance would, would be guaranteed to work past their stand. Um, so there's been quite, quite strict guidelines. And I think, you know, if it's professional organisations, um, you know, running these things, it's very different to, to going to your friend's house where I think, yeah, probably social distancing hasn't always been respected. Yeah. yeah. Do we also think that maybe um, uh, reps might make a comeback coming to people's studios to show the products? I think, um, I, I guess that the, the, the first question there is, will practices be, com when will they be comfortable to have people coming into their office? Um, so that, that's the biggest one, obviously, it's not something that we we've thought about doing yet um really because people are, are not ready uh for that to happen but i definitely think long term um that that's something that could could well make more of a comeback but uh eve i think you said it before i think for design practices they perhaps a bit more vetting or a bit more information before they accept invites uh to go in and present so they can pick and choose products that are perhaps more suited to the work that they do, that kind of thing, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, Eve, I was... This is take it far away. <laughs> it's, this question was kind of directed a little bit to Paul Shoesmith and, and Marcus. I think it's possible that there might end up being like a two-tier system where um, the manufacturers really want to deal with the people that specify the most. <laughs> And so you might end up, you know, having kind of 
and is having more preference over our smaller practices. Oh, Marcus, what do you think about that? <laughs> I think it's 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 an interesting it's an interesting question because um, Eve, you mentioned earlier on, you've got manufacturers who are putting their budget into appealing to practices and going very much targeted on practices, but they're probably people they've already dealt with. So they're just maintaining those relationships, making sure they have good knowledge. How do you get to meet new people? And then I can see the question here, there's sort of, there's one where we've got uh, talking about how important is it to see the products and like, how am I going to decide what I'm going to do? Am I just going to use companies who I know? And a lot of the time it probably is going to be tried and trusted companies, people who I trust. I have been during lockdown, had a few companies that are sending me samples. I've requested things to be sent to me at home and then I've tested and tried it at home. Uh, they very much need to make sure that it is just plug and play so I can just get it up and running because I'm not in the office. I can't wire anything up myself. So I don't want to be doing that at home. I just want to be able to test it out. But yeah, a lot of it's going to be tried and tested. And are we going to see, because we're not really going to get a lot of live events, are we going to see a return of the knowledge that designers hold over suppliers and who is good and who isn't? Is that going to be more valued now? Because that's kind of departed a little bit because everything's online. Everything is very open. And a lot of people have gone and looked around and found out this information and they can just go, right, well, we know everything. We know all the different manufacturers now because it's a bit more closed off. You haven't got as much in the way of exhibitions and personal first hand evidence that it's right that's not as easy to come by maybe your relationships with your suppliers is going to be more of a benefit as a designer it comes back to that that point i made earlier was about seeing the lit effects like you say um and i think half the the fun and excitement of working in this industry is finding you know new products new brands that kind of thing and that's kind of where frankfurt's always been uh, a good event is you stumble across uh, a company you've never heard of before you're like well, wow how, how have i never seen these guys before and that that's you know this this like you say there's two elements to it is is the tried and trusted people you you know you can rely on um but also there's always that extra element is to to, to grow and and to improve your work i guess you need to be able to witness and see all these other brands that you perhaps haven't seen before and it's how you get around that certainly in the short term i mean like you said hopefully things will return back to a semblance of normality but it's it's keeping that that knowledge like you say of of, of products outside of the the, the normal the normal ones that you use or work with on the, on the flip side of that, it's also really to miss a, a, an interesting company like the building, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think there's this, this, I've talked about it before and um, John has just posted in the chat about it, is that this disconnect between the design community and the manufacturers. Often designers are almost reluctant to engage with suppliers and manufacturers because it is very salesy it's very pushy and you you're there and you're trying to find products and it's quite overwhelming as well there's a lot of manufacturers and suppliers out there who want to talk to you and there's only so much time that you have to discuss these things and but it is having that relationship having the ability to know what is good and what isn't who to go to who might be able to make a product what you want or customize things i mean paul i know you and i have done this together we've worked together making custom fittings because i needed someone to do that and that's born out of the fact that we've met and we've talked about it at shows and then i've got in contact and how do you build up those contact lists and have yeah. those relationships and a lot of the time uh, that is by in-person meetings and also on the flip side it's about people you trust. And so sales reps and people working for manufacturers, they might have a, know a lot of designers who trust them to actually give them honest advice. I think, I think what it's gonna enforce is actually improvement of sales techniques. Sometimes I feel like the lighting industry is a little bit backwards in the way that it approaches sales in that 
manufacturers and suppliers, some of them, not all of them, but some of them just think it's a case of, right, here's everything, this is what we do, go and specify it, rather than coming in and trying to find out what is right and giving honest advice. There's a couple of sales reps who I really respect from uh, some distributors and manufacturers because when I call them up and I ask them about a product, they'll tell me, they'll say, you know what? That's not the right one for you. Don't use it for that. And I, I know that I can call them and I can trust them because they're going to help me find the right product to use on a project and they're going to be honest with me. And I think that's what we need to see the movement I, or I think that's what a lot of manufacturers and suppliers need to move to is not a point of sell, sell, sell. It's how can I help you? How yeah. can I support you as a designer and make, give you what you need to use on projects? Well, everybody, I couldn't agree with Marcus Moore as a lighting designer myself back in the day. And John Bullock has put up another quote for us saying the most important person used to be the architectural librarian or the person that looked after your uh, brochures and things in the office the relationship between the lighting designer and the rep is paramount and especially quite often in architecture there isn't a thing that fits exactly in that nook and cranny that you need and so having the ability for manufacturers to custom make things for you or change them in some way is absolutely you know, necessary for our jobs I think um, that we all agree that we all miss each other terribly face to face um, to catch up, uh, to talk about things in a, in a slow, slower way than sometimes is forced when we do things virtually. Um, but there is definitely so much for us to talk about in terms of live events and virtual events. So perhaps we could come around the table again, the virtual table again in the future to pick up on some of those things we've spoken about. But it's not all bad in the virtual world. Um, it does enable us to save time save on our carbon footprint from going to places and meeting some new people in these type of uh, group situations. And um, essentially touching more people or being able to communicate people in one go. This session has been recorded and will pop it up on all our social media uh, channels and things through all the people that are on, on the panel. So if you haven't watched now, hopefully you can recommend and you can watch us later with a nice cup of tea. I'd like to thank Marcus and Paul for um, instigating this conversation and for Eve and Paul James for joining us today. Thanks very much, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.